All right, we are um, jumping into chapter 4 this evening, Romans chapter 4. We are concluding chapter 3. Remember, uh, chapters 1, 2, and most of chapter 3 are kind of the first section of Romans where uh, Paul is making what point? Just broadly thinking of it, one, two, and three. What, what's the general point? Okay. All have sinned. All stand in condemnation. And then the rest of chapter three that we talked about last week focuses on what? Where does the answer come? All right. Jesus, it does not come from The law. So, verse 21, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been shown. And when we talk about the righteousness of God, as I suggested last week, um, I would suggest that it's not uh, the way that God makes us righteous. Instead, the question that Paul was dealing with in the first century with the Judaizing teachers and such Paul's message sounds, if what Paul is saying is true, it sounds as if God has what? If what Paul is saying is true, then that means that God has what? Say that again? All right. Uh, Aaron said that God has not kept his promises, that God is unfaithful to his covenant, He's unfaithful to the promises that have been made. God is not righteous. That's what they're saying. Paul, if what you're saying is true, then you are making God out to be someone who is not righteous and who has not kept his promises, which is why they reject it, because, of course, can God be unrighteous? No, of course not, right? So they would say, Paul, you're mistaken. And Paul says, whoa, wait just a second. What if God's righteousness, that is, his faithfulness to his promises, is faithful to his covenant, what if the cross is the very means by which God's righteousness or faithfulness to his promises, he shows it through the cross? What if that is the means by which his righteousness to his, or his faithfulness to his promises is shown? That's Paul's basic claim in chapter 3, that Jesus on the cross, uh, he was raised and put on the cross so that God could very publicly show him, demonstrate uh, his righteousness at the present time, so that God could be two things. What? He could be just, but also the one who justifies Both actions are done through Jesus on the cross. Uh, So that is his his main basic point. And then we we, uh, kind of flew through the end there where he talks about the idea of boasting. By the way, when when Paul talks about boasting, what, what is that referring to? Have we had this conversation before? I'm not sure if we have. Okay. All right. I would say yes, but I want you uh, to clarify. Do we have a mic that's roaming around by chance? We do. We have a mic with a mic. Um, Yeah, so Dave, over here, I I want you to expound. Dave said... Uh, righteousness according to the law, is that what you said, I think? Yeah. yeah. Expound the, on that. Just The righteousness of the law, uh, being complying with the law of Moses, or your righteousness is based on your compliance with the law of Moses, is what I was thinking. Okay. All right, so I'm going to just try to finagle that just a little bit. Are you referring to some kind of meritorious service to the law, as in you have earned it and therefore you boast. That's what I was suggesting. And, okay. you know, the, 
that, that seemed to be the attitude of the Jews toward the law. Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, they just saw it as their possession, as their right, mm -hmm. as their heritage, uh, as part of what God had blessed them with, but they also, uh, depending on what group you were a member of, some, like the Pharisees, emphasized strict adherence to certain traditions and mm -hmm. so forth. So, Yeah, I, I would say uh, what Dave just said is, is probably the most common way of understanding the idea of boasting as Paul says it, based on the idea that many people assume that Paul is making a works versus faith type of a discussion, and it's about doing the things that earn salvation, um, that is, making yourself righteous, therefore you have something to boast about uh, because of the works that you've done. I think I would push back against that. Um, their boasting, I don't think, is in themselves. What is their boasting in for these, these Judaizing teachers, these Jewish Christians who are still upholding, you know, ro rightly so, they have every right to uphold their Judaism, but what does it mean that they, they're boasting? What is their boasting in? Okay. Okay. All right, so Aaron said, the law, Jan said, in Abraham, they claim they are the sons of Abraham, and she's getting ahead of us, running into chapter 4 with that comment, because that's where we're going, ultimately. But yeah, they're, they're boasting is a, it's a means of showing their superiority over those who don't have the covenant with God through Moses. Um, they don't boast in their own actions and their own meritorious works and deeds. They boast in the fact that they have the law of Moses, they have a special relationship with God, the covenant on Sinai, they have a, a lineage, as Jan said, that goes back to Abraham, they have all these things that all these Gentiles out here don't have. And that makes them superior over them. But what if what Paul is saying takes away any superiority that they have over the law? Do they have any boasting any longer? And that's why he says, where is boasting? There is no boasting. You as a Jew, even a Jewish Christian, you have no superior place over those Gentiles. You have no right of boasting in your special relationship with God through the law. It's not there. There is no boasting Jews over Gentiles any longer. And he says, okay, well then, you know, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No. This is a law of faith. And so he says we're transitioning mindset-wise from a law that has the works of the law. And, you know, and I'm not taking away from what Dave said. Did they value the works of the law and find that they would be considered justified because of it? Yeah. But again, it wasn't an attitude that says I've earned my justification. It's an attitude that says as long as I've done these things, then I maintain the relationship by which I'm justified in the law. I know that sounds pretty similar, but there, there's certainly a nuance there that, that is different. Um, so, verse 29, is God the God of the Jews only? That is, do we have this to boast? Of course not. He's also the God of the Gentiles as well. And then verse 31, do we then nullify the law through faith. That is, do we say that the law itself is unimportant, means absolutely nothing, because we're basing things on faith? He says, of course not. It's by this that we actually uphold the law. That, that the law itself, and everything regarding the law, the prophets, all of that is upheld, first and foremost, by faith. And that's demonstrated, first and foremost, by whom? Abraham. This brings us then into chapter 4. 
in chapter 4, what shall we say then? If you, if you want to have this conversation about who's better than whom, let's go back and let's talk about Abraham and what did he boast in? What was so important to him? Did he boast in his relationship that he had in God through works of the law? I mean, that, that's kind of the basis of where we're starting here, right? That's where we ended chapter 3. Do, does our relationship with God through the law of Moses give us a, a special relationship that nobody else has? He says, let's go back to Abraham. He's the father of all of the Jews, right? Um, and, and let me ask this, and, and I kind of just gave away a little bit, um, but why is that so important? Why do you think he starts off by talking about Abraham, who is our forefather according to the flesh? Why does he start off with that reminder, Mike? Well, not, not only is he the patriarch of patriarchs, but he's also before the law. Okay. All right. Okay, so you've given us an argument for something that we're going to be talking about in a couple minutes. But why does he bring to their attention the idea of him being their father according to the flesh? Yeah, Bruce? Mike's coming. <coughs> well, Abraham was one of the first uh, Jews early on in the history of the Jewish people, and, um, and they were very familiar with him. And um, it's quoted in the Old Testament that, that uh, he found favor with God, and he was righteous. Okay. Yeah, not just one of the first. He is the first. Um, every bit of boasting that any Jew had in a special relationship with God that comes through the Mosaic Covenant, first and foremost, comes from Abraham, right? Right? Without the promise to Abraham, by which God, remember, you have everybody um, that, that's out there, you have everyone, and then God narrows the field down, as far as his promise is concerned, his covenant is concerned, to now... To now it's through the family of Abraham itself. Remember, we've talked about this on our Sunday nights. And eventually, this is going to be narrowed down again, right? We'll talk about that in just a second. But as we've now gone from everyone being part of God's covenantal people, with what covenants do we find before Abraham? Covenants with Adam. Right? One other one? Noah. Noah. Both Adam and Noah, which are both creation accounts. You have the creation account and then Adam. Decreation happens in the flood. Creation happens again. So you have now a new uh, covenant with Noah at that point. So you have these two covenants, and they're with whom? Everybody. Me, you, everyone is part of those covenants. <clears throat> Chapter 12 is the first time that he narrows it down to a very specific family among the rest of the families that are out there. Because at the time, yeah, it was one certain family, Noah, one certain family, Adam, but it was one family without any others at the time, right? This is one among the many. And so he narrows it down and says, now y'all, and that causes the people from Abraham to say, well, I've got Abraham's blood running in my veins. I'm in a very special relationship with God because I am physically descended from this guy, and we all are. This is going to be a huge point that's going to crop back up in chapter, chapter 9, 10, 11, around in there. Uh, but especially chapter 9, he's going to pick this back up, this idea of being descended from Abraham in the flesh, that idea. He's going to pick it up and really 
talk about that in chapter 9. He's introducing the idea right now as he introduces Abraham himself. So all of that to say he's laying groundwork for what he's going to do eventually. Does that make sense? All right, so we'll move a little faster now. Um, if Abraham was justified by works, he does have something to boast about. That is, he claims a very special relationship with God because of whatever covenant that he has established because of the things that he has done, right? But is that the case? All right, but not before God. And I think all of this is going to the statement that Mike made just a few minutes ago. Um, he answered the question that I hadn't quite asked just yet, but he answered it correctly. So I'll put him on the spot here and see if he remembers what it was that he had said just a minute ago. Um, what is the significance, Mike, with starting with Abraham, if we're having a discussion about the law of Moses? Well, Abraham is the, the Jew of all Jews. Mm -hmm. He is the beginning of the Jewish nation uh, in bloodline. And he is justified prior to the law. Okay. All right. Um, someone give me just a general date for Abraham. All right, 2000. That's fine. I usually say 2100, but... When you get to that point, you know, this is give or take a century or whatever the case might be. So that's fine. We'll, we'll do that. Someone give me a date for the Law of Moses. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. I'm going to narrow that down. Rough, yeah, whatever. Fifteen hundred. That's fine. I usually do around fourteen fifty or so, but this will work. 2,000, 1,500, this works. All right. To get the idea, though, which one of these numbers is earlier? Remember, we're in B.C., so... Yeah, very good. A lot of people are pointing at, at the board, and they are pointing to this one. He predates the Law of Moses by five, 600 years. I think a lot of this discussion in Chapter 4 stems probably from discussions that they would have had saying, hey, if Moses gave the law to the people in, or if God gave the law to the people in Moses' day, then how were all of those people before Moses justified? How did God have a special relationship with them? Does that sound like the type of questions that we might ask sometimes? We might say, well, if Jesus came onto the scene and zero, um, you know, I don't know what number you give. I usually give about, eight, you know, AD 30. Some of you guys might have 80, though, apparently, you know, by the numbering. So, you know, AD 30, right, the cross? Um, what about all those people before the cross? Has anybody ever wondered about that? Asked that question? Had that question asked? Discussed that question? What about the saints of old? How did they have salvation if they were before the cross? Anybody? Heard? Yeah. I would imagine the Jews have the same questions. How did, what about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the rest of the patriarchs? What about these people of old? How were they in a right relationship with God before the law of Moses? And what's the answer? By faith. No. That's the answer we would give, because Paul tells us. What's their answer? He may have been before the law, but what did, what did he do? What did Abraham do? He obeyed. A little more specific. The works of the law. Maybe not all of them, but one, what one biggie did he do? Circumcision, sacrifices at the altar, various things. The big one, though, is circumcision, isn't it? Isn't that the sign of the Mosaic Law? And you could say, well, you know, of course, 
Maybe Abraham lived before God gave that law of circumcision to Moses, uh, but he did it. He is performing the works of the law before the law was given. And that's how they're justified, because even though it hadn't been given yet, you can see them doing the various works of the law, and so they kind of create this law as they, as Lorraine said, they obey God in these various ways, very specifically. But can you see that argumentation that's there? Uh, that, yeah, they're obeying the law. They're justified by the works of the law even before the works of the law were ever given to them. So, he talks here about Abraham. He says, what does the scripture say? That Abraham believed God, it was credited to him for righteousness. All right. So, um, someone give me a, Genesis, obviously, is our book. What chapter? For this quotation, what chapter? Genesis 15. Very good. Genesis, well... I said it, and then I started not to even write it. Genesis chapter 15, it says that uh, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, right? So, everybody sees in Genesis chapter 15, it makes this statement. And that is where Paul is going to build his argument. Um, now, let's see here. He talks about the idea of, you know, not to the one who works, uh, wait, I'm sorry, to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but is as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on the one who declares the ungodly to be righteous, his faith is credited for righteousness. So this is a comparison of the works of the law versus faith, remember? That's the discussion point. And I find it really interesting that he just totally switches gears at this point, doesn't he? Because who does he now bring up? All right, he brings up David. So, you know, I'm going to, well, man, all kinds of things that I want to keep up here. First of all, what does David have to do with our discussion? Yeah, Kelly just said the next choke point. We've talked about this. That as far as the promises go and the covenants go, David's the next one in line, that the promises flow from Abraham and then through his family at large, but then it comes down to David. In what passage? You might be off by just that first word. Yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I know it's what you meant. I, I knew, I knew that's what you meant. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Don't worry, Dave, nobody online. You weren't mic Dave. So nobody online knows that you got the wrong book and you said 1 Samuel instead of 2 Samuel. So we'll keep that between us. Yeah. Um, so we go from Abra Ab everyone to Abraham, and now the next one is going to be the line of David itself. He is just as important as Abraham is to the Israel story. Um, he is the great king. Uh, he is the Messiah prefigure. Uh, you know, the messianic kingdom is going to come from him. He's the one who establishes God's true kingdom. He's the one that it said he's a man after God's heart. And he's the one who wrote Psalm 32. How does Psalm 32 begin? All right, you don't have to turn back to Psalm 32 to get this one, right? As Kelly just said, blessed are those whose sins, whose lawless acts are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the person the Lord uh, will never charge with sin. All right. Why is that important? Why quote David here? Yeah, Ryan, back there. Well, David says, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, mm -hmm. but there was no forgiveness under the law of Moses. Oh, there was, there's forgiveness for some things, right? But follow, keep, keep following your thread. No forgiveness for what? Who's the one who's saying this? David. Yeah, so follow that, that line there, Ryan. Why David in particular when it talks about sins that are forgiven? What can you tell me about David? Because of his sin with Bathsheba. Yeah, tell me some of the things that David did in that sin with Bathsheba. Had Uriah killed. What's, okay, murder? Um, he covered it up. Covered it up, well, okay. with the murder of her. Bearing Uriah. false witness, right? Um, the adultery itself. All right, adultery. Here, I'm just going to pull the mic away. You guys can just belt them out. I know you, I know you got them, but we'll just, just throw them out. We've got murder, bearing false witness, adultery. All right, covetousness, coveting your neighbor's wife. And if you, you follow the story that Nathan, the prophet, gave, what is it? Theft. Right? You guys heard those before? Those sins? Yeah, they make the top ten, don't they? I mean, these, these are the worst ones. And to, to Ryan's point, where is the sacrifice that you can offer in order to have your sinfulness of adultery or murder covered, taken away? Where is that in the Law of Moses? Yeah. David should have been executed a couple times over. Strictly according to the law of Moses. Strictly according to the things that they're supposed, that they are putting their trust, their confidence in. And uh, when it comes to somebody who is to be justified according to the things that you do out of the law of Moses, can David be a part of that? Not at all, right? The law of Moses cannot help David. And yet, even so, even after in Psalm 51, right away, after you know, he gets confronted by Nathan the prophet, and he says, look, you know what? If there was a sacrifice that I could do, what does he say? I'd do it. But there isn't. The only sacrifice that God would accept is what? Yeah, yeah, a broken and contrite heart, O oh Lord, you will not despise. That's the only one that there is. And yet, he writes Psalm 32 and says, Man, it feels great to have your sins forgiven. <laughs> that should be an elephant in the room for people who feel as if the law of Moses is what justifies, right? Right? Shouldn't that be a problem when it comes right down to it? I think Paul is very specifically, without having to expressly state all of this, I think he is just kind of wedging David and David's sinfulness with Bathsheba and, and the forgiveness that he receives. In fact, he is called a what? What's he called? David, he's known as a... A man after God's heart? Yeah, well, I mean, that was, that was when he was really young, of course. We're talking 1 Samuel 13 at that point. He wasn't even king. That's before Bathsheba. This, it, it completely changed after the events with Bathsheba, right? No. He maintains that title. People later still refer to him in that way. He doesn't lose being a man after God's heart because he had done these things. Where does he have that confidence in Psalm 32? Because it certainly could not come from the law of Moses, right? 
Does everybody see why just throwing David in here is just a masterful stroke on Paul's part? That throwing out Abraham, throwing out David, who are the heroes that are left? You've kind of taken the biggies at this point, right? That's what he's doing. That's what he's accomplishing here, saying, yeah, these are the ones who have been justified by the works of the law. No, at least not David. But we did mention before, didn't we? Wasn't Abraham circumcised? And didn't he have his children circumcised? according to a law that was eventually going to be within the law of Moses? I mean, if you continue to follow uh, Paul's train of thought here, he says that in verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Or is it also for those who are uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted? Was it before or after his circumcision. So that's why I say, I think there's a conversation in the background that has already taken place. We're stepping in the middle of a conversation and, and he's already, you know, he already knows that the Jews have this conversation about these people of old before the law of Moses. How were they justified? And I think the answer in that conversation that we're just not privy to but I think the conversation is something like this. They were justified because they performed works of the law of Moses. They were circumcised or did this or did that. These, these things that crop up in the Genesis account that then show themselves in the law of Moses in various ways. And they say, aha, look, see, even before the law, they were justified because they were doing the works of the law even before given. And Paul says, think that one. When was Abraham circumcised? Give me a chapter. What's that? 17, yes. Genesis chapter 17. Sorry, I had to go silent there because I knew I would misspell circumcision otherwise if I tried to talk well. Trying, I may have done it anyway. No, I think that's right. All right, so in chapter 17, Abraham is given the command of circumcision, and he circumcises his kids or his whole household and everybody else, right? So what does this tell us about Abraham being justified? That is, being seen as righteous. When did that happen? In Genesis 15 or Genesis 17? Yeah, in chapter 15. It was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, however long the period of time is between Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, Abraham has gone all this time already having been declared to be righteous by God before he ever picks up that knife in Genesis chapter 17. Does that make sense? So, Paul's point then is, contrary to what they may have taught, does his circumcision that happened later have anything at all to do with his righteousness before God? So what's the follow-through point? Where's, where's the payoff of this for him? For Paul, I mean, not Abraham. For Paul. Remember, go back to the very beginning. Abraham is the... the father of us all. And the idea, I think, being, in the same way that your father is justified, you are justified. 
Abraham was not justified by any work found in the law, even though he did perform works that were found in the law, right? He's not justified those, he, by those. He is justified solely by faith, right? Everybody see that? So what's the payoff then? Why does that matter? All right, comes to whom? In particular. Yeah, to Abraham. Remember, the same way that the father is justified, the children will be justified. Therefore, if Abraham is justified by faith without reference to the works of the law, thus all who are descended from him are justified by faith without reference to works of the law. Does everybody kind of follow why this is important to the discussion and how how this plays into it? However, you might say, what is our discussion point? Are we talking about simply justification by faith versus works? No, we've been hammering it that it's what? Okay. Say it again, real loud. All right, in case you didn't hear Josie, works of the law versus faith in Christ. Are we talking about faith in Christ here? Of course not, right? What did he believe? He wasn't showing faith in Christ. He was showing faith in what? God's promise that, what was it in Genesis 15 that he believed? Okay, yes, he would have a son, and we know that that's that's the implied, I mean, because that's that's how it starts off. He says, Eliezer of Damascus, this this guy, this foreigner, is going to get everything, and the implied point of that statement to God is, yeah, you kind, of you kind of haven't done what you said you were going to do. You haven't given me a son yet. And he was told to go outside and do what? Count the stars if you're able. Finish it. So shall your descendants be. This is a promise about how many of these guys are going to be out there, right? And that's what he believes and is credited as righteousness. So his faith isn't exactly the same, is it? I mean, we believe, we have faith in Jesus Christ, whereas his faith was in this promise, right? Same promise, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's not the same promise, right? Well, he had the promise of the seed, the seed promise. We are, we are the beneficiaries of the seed promise, right? Okay, all right, so you do have at least the, the promise of the seed that comes through and blesses everybody. Um, yes, uh, but I think Genesis 15, yes, is, is part of that and ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus. So I can, I can see what you're saying there. Um, I would say, first of all, most of you are like, okay, we, we know enough about Chris that he's setting something up at this point, so you are not eager to jump in with uh, both feet into the pool. I mean, Mike's going to do it. He's, he's always willing to play the game. Um, well, how, how about I try? That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise might, re- might rest on grace. Okay. So that would be the promise we have, the promise that we have through Christ, which is the grace that he brought to us. Yes, and, and, and let, we're going to dissect that, that very bit in just a second. First of all, let me suggest when he says from faith to faith in chapter 1, this is the type of stuff he's talking about. You know, when he says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's uh, 117. When he says that, I, I, at least my understanding of this, what he's trying to get across is, is that different people in different places and times had different promises. 
and their trust in God was based on the promises that were given to them in their day and their time. And so from faith to faith, whatever place they were in the story, whatever promises were given, their trust that they had at that moment um, would make them uh, justified because of their faith for them in their moment. Does that make sense? I think that's what that faith to faith means. However, let's look at the rest of Paul's discussion here in the next four minutes. Um, we have talked about this in our Sunday evening class, so I'm hoping, it's been a while since we were talking about Abraham, but I'm hoping that some of this will still be there. When you go back to Genesis chapter 15, and we don't need to go back there because Paul does it for us here, he's going to make a comparison. Um, in Genesis chapter 15, he says, um, let's see, I'm going to start, verse 17, as it is, well, I'm just going to start 16. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, not just those who are of the law, but those who are of Abraham's faith, right? We talked about this in Galatians. It's not those of the flesh who are descended from Abraham, right, or who are his children, those of faith. We're going to pick this back up again in chapter 9. Um, this is going to be a key point when we get there. But he says in verse, uh, verse 17, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in God's sight, in whom Abraham believed. The God who does what? Gives life. Gives life to the dead. Calls things into existence that do not exist. Now, let's break down what Paul says about Abraham and Sarah. He says they were pretty old, right? And so you have Abraham's body and Sarah's womb. What word does he use for both of them? Dead. All right, so he says Abraham was pretty old. And when he thought about, now we know the history, was Abraham able to have kids? Yeah, he had quite a few more, right, than just uh, Isaac. But when he's given this, we're talking about, you know, his mindset when he's given this problem, what does he consider about his own body? As far as having kids, as far as producing life, it's dead. Sarah's womb, as far as producing life, it is what? Dead. And yet, what did God promise? What was the promise? Okay, that God would make life from what? From death to create a blessing for all. Isn't that what he believed? His body's dead, Sarah's womb is dead, Having a child, creating life, it's all dead, but God promised life to fulfill the promise, and this is what Mike was saying, to fulfill the promise of grace, to fulfill what was ultimately going to come, to bless the entire world. He believed that God would make life from death in order to create a blessing for everybody. Can I interchange this phrase with, regarding anybody else? Not Isaac, but whom? Was, was given life from death 
in order to create a blessing for all. Isn't that Jesus? Isn't that the exact same story of Jesus? That Abraham's justification is very, very specifically tied to the promise that God is going to make life from death in order to create a blessing for everyone. And so we ask the question then, what does this have anything to do with Paul's discussion about justified us being justified by works or justified, works of the law are justified by faith in Jesus Christ? Was their faith faith in Jesus Christ? Well, no. But in essence, it's the exact same thing that we believe, isn't it? We also put our hope, our trust, our confidence, everything about us as Christians is all in the blessing that comes from God because he made life in the body of Jesus where there was only death. Look at verse 23. I'm going to switch the ESV here. Verse 23. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours. It will be counted who believe what? Who believe... All right, and the one who raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus our Lord. He was delivered up for our trespasses. He was raised for our justification. In other words, he went into death very specifically as that propitiatory sacrifice. But if he remains in death, does that death mean anything? If he, if he goes into the grave and never comes out, he's just what? Another criminal that hung on a tree, right? That's all he is. The power of the cross only comes because God made life from death. He went to death because of our sins. But the power of the cross and the only means by which it brings justification to us is if we also believe that he made life from that death. And in that way, our faith in Jesus is pretty much the exact same faith that Abraham had when he was given his promise. Does everybody see Paul's tie-in argument? as far as Abraham and, and David as well. But this is setting up the moment, really, I mean, really, the, the heart of who and what Jesus is is going to come in the next chapter. Because he says, yeah, we went back to Abraham. Have we gone back far enough yet? No, if we're going to talk about who and what Jesus is and his purpose, it's not based in Moses and the law, he says, it goes back to Abraham. No, no, no. It, it, next week, it's going to go even further back. All the way to what man? Adam. And that's what we'll jump into next week. All right, there are handouts. I put them in the foyer this time. Hopefully you saw them. Um, some people were complaining that uh, they were missing the handouts because I put them in an inopportune spot, so put them in a different inopportune spot, so hopefully you uh, saw those out there and can pick one up. Um, and right now, we're officially ahead of schedule, so that's a weird feeling. I don't usually feel this uh, very often, so we'll get into that. Questions before we close it up? All right. Yes, Joe. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying this, uh, uh, Joe said, funneling the other way, we can actually see the story going through David to Jesus. And, and I think we're supposed to see that line from Jesus, David, Abraham, and moving all the way back. Um, but the focus next week, yes, is going to be on the comparison of Jesus and Adam.
All right, thanks a lot, guys. Got to close it up here. Good class, good discussion.